Hello, hello, Anthem. I'm going to ask all of you, if you would, to squeeze in. Let's make some room on the edges of these rows for people coming in the back. So if you could just take a moment and move in, we would greatly appreciate it. How's everyone doing? Okay? Happy Sabbath to everyone. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us at Anthem, which is our modern worship service here at the Loma Linda University Church. My name is Joelle Royer, and I am one of 18 pastors here. We have a large pastoral staff of amazing people, and I am just here to welcome you this Sabbath morning here. If you would like to make Anthem your home, we would love you to. There are some ways that you can connect here. The first thing you can do, as you came in the back, you probably noticed our Discipleship Center with the Easy Up and the bright pink sign. If you would like more information about this community, you can go out there and talk to someone on our team. You can also text Anthem at the number that is provided, 55498, to get more information. And if you are a first time guest, we're so glad that you're here. We have something really special for you. So if you are a first time guest, text Anthem at 55498, fill out the connect card, and then after this service, you can go out to the Discipleship Center and pick up your awesome gift. Well, one of the things that we believe here at Anthem is we believe that giving is a part of worship. And so we want to give you the opportunity to give. And guess what? We have options for you. The first one is part of our team. They're going to go um, down the rows here with a basket to collect. And also you can give at our number, 55498. There are a few things that are happening this summer in our young adult ministry with Pastor Philip and his team. I see you, Pastor Phil. Praxis is the name of our young adult ministry, and they have 12 weeks of summer that are, they're going to be weekly events that are going on. This is really a good way for you if you're wanting to make some more friends or some new friends cool off a lot of their events, particularly today, from four to nine, and you're invited. They are going to be at a Thousand Steps Beach, which is down in Laguna, correct, Pastor Phil? So go down there, cool off, beat the heat, and join the Praxis community. They also have a lot of other things going, and so you can find out more information by checking out their Instagram. One other thing that I would like to share with you, particularly, it's very precious to me, because one of the reasons that I am actually still involved here at church is because I got involved with ministry. In that time with serving, I met amazing friends that I have to this day. I grew spiritually, and it was just an awesome season and continues to be an awesome season in my life. So if you have made Anthem your home, I really want to encourage you, get involved. Don't just be someone who comes and sits and leaves. Get involved, build community, you will not regret it. And there are ways that you can get involved here at Anthem. You can help out at the coffee bar out there. You can get involved in hospitality. You can get involved in worship here on the platform and also with our production team. So I just want to encourage you, you will not regret getting involved. Make community for yourself. It makes a big, large church a whole lot smaller. I would also um, this morning like to invite one of my colleagues, Pastor Chris Stanley and Sophia up at this moment. There is something very special happening today, and Pastor Chris is going to tell you a little bit about it. Thank you so much. Hi, Sophia. 
How are you? I'm What's happening today? I'm getting baptized. I love it. Everybody lift your hands and say, we love you, Sophia. We, love you, Sophia. we will be there for you, Sophia. We'll there for you. <laughs> I love it. Sophia, why are you getting baptized today? Mm, because I'm giving my life to God. So good. Sophia's family and friends, can we stand for a moment of recognition? You bought everyone and I love it. It's so good up the back. We bought aunties, uncles, grandfathers. It's beautiful. Thank you so much, family, for coming along. Have a seat. Sophia really wanted to be baptised during this service because the Anthem community is feeding her soul. It's an amazing thing. The only problem is, is when we set up our font there yesterday, it started leaking. We'd lent it to somebody else. We won't say who they are, but when it came back, we set it up and we discovered it was leaking when water was falling through to the media department. So, <laughs> what we're doing today is at the conclusion of this service, we're going to simply head out past the coffee bar and we have our outdoor font set up there. It's leaking onto the patio, but that's not a problem. What we're going to do is, if you're able, we would love your support because this is a life-changing decision. This is not a small moment. This is when a person gives their heart and soul to Christ in this world. It is a powerful and a beautiful moment. So if you have the opportunity, once this service finishes, we'll be doing the baptism right out there. We'll crowd around on the balcony and we'll come and we'll show our support for Sophia in this. Sophia, we love you. You're amazing. You're an incredibly gifted person. You have talents. She led worship this morning in our high school area and it was wonderful. Uh, you are going to be an absolute force for good in this world. Congratulations on your amazing decision. Thank you. That is awesome. We hope that you all will support Sophia after this service. Well, it is getting time for our message. I would like to invite you to bow your heads as we have a word of prayer before we hear from Pastor Miguel. Father God, you are incredible. I don't know where any of us would be without you. I don't even want to think about it. But God, we invite you through your Holy Spirit to just come into this room, to bathe us, to just speak into our lives. Each one of us needs a customized, hand-tailored message from you, from heaven to our souls. So I pray that you will do that for each one of us and that you will anoint Pastor Miguel with the words that you have placed on his heart to share with us. God, never leave us. Thank you for your unconditional love, for your acceptance of each one of us, and for calling us to a transformed life through you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to take just some time to look at the image that is projecting behind me. Let it kind of sink into your heart. Let it bring up some emotions, some feelings. A German writer and art critic, Heinz, Heinz Kleiss, looking at this image, says that it's like staring into a void. The author of this particular picture, this painting entitled The Monk and the Sea, is the famous German painter, Heinrich Friedrich. And... He is attempting, I think, to capture a story that commences as he, is swimming, as he is swimming. Friedrich had lost his mother and a sister. 
And one day in 1789, as he is out in the middle of a lake, he starts struggling. His brother Johann jumps into the water, saves him, and after a few moments, Friedrich sees his beloved brother disappear under the waves. It is from that moment on that this desire starts burning up in the artist's heart, the desire to capture that which is the most difficult thing to do in art, namely emptiness. And so one night, it had to have been night. He's painting. And in the foreground of the picture, there are three ships. And we don't know why. But he decided to grab a brush, dip it in some blue paint, and meticulously start painting over that. And what results from that act is the realization that like Surgeon General Vivek Murphy spoke about last year, we in this place and in this time are dealing with an epidemic. Murphy expressed this by noting that one in every two Americans are are suffering with measurable degrees of loneliness. He spoke about the ill effects that this has on health and noted that it presents a national health crisis as loneliness can be equated with higher instances of stroke and heart disease. The issue is so deep that Murphy is talking about equating loneliness with smoking cigarettes every day. So both Friedrich and Murphy are looking at a reality that is part and parcel of being human. And it almost seems like they find a conversation partner in the writings of Israel's preeminent preacher. If you have a Bible, I'll invite you to open it as we consider for the homily today, the fourth chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, verses 9 through 12. Now, as you thumb through your Bibles, let me tell you that Ecclesiastes represents the collection of the wisdom observed by the sage. It develops in a formula that we can actually recognize quite easily if we thumb through those chapters. In essence, the preacher will look at the world as it exists and then will present and provide an analysis of what it means to be human. As he considers what he has seen, he will say that everything is vanity. He will talk about our drive to be remembered by the things we do and the things we construct. And he will say it is all fleeting, vapor, like running after the wind. He will talk about our desire for control. And he will call it foolishness. And it's almost as if the author is presenting through his homily a choice for us to make. A choice between two paths. Because at one moment he will say vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. And then he will say, remember your creator in the days of your youth. At one point he will say, everything is fleeting and there is no sense or reason to the world. And at the other moment he will say, there is, some, there is a time for everything under the sun. And so what are these two paths? These two paths that you and I are called to explore as we live under the constant threat of loneliness. Well, on the one hand, you have rugged individualism. That desire to climb the corporate ladder that has become synonymous with American culture. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you have these words. Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. Contrary to rugged individualism, the preacher presents us with a view that is calling for a regula. 
Now, I know that that word doesn't seem to register as you hear it, regula. It is a Latin word. If you speak Spanish, you might have recognized it already. It's where we get our Spanish word regla from. And for those of you who don't know how to speak Spanish, the secret to it is you got to roll your R's, church. Regla. There we go. Now, the English translation for regla or regula is rule. But in Adventist churches, when we start talking about rule, we almost rules, we almost always fall into the temptation of equating rules and legalism. But regula, that word that the author uses to describe this alternate path for those of us who are called to live lonely lives, is not really a set of rules, it's a trellis. The best translation that I can find for the Latin regula is trellis. Now, you might be asking this morning, what is a trellis? And if you're a gardener, you know the answer to that. Because a trellis is a structure that we create in order to provide support for vines or plants. Actually, if the vine or the plant doesn't have a trellis, they will go, grow downward. And the fruit that it produces will rot right there on the vine. Absent the care of a loving and patient gardener, plants in the wild will use anything they can as a trellis. They'll use a tree or a rock in order to bear fruit. Now in the church for 2,000 years, we've been talking a lot about fruit, haven't we? And we've equated fruit with this idea of good actions, good actions that we perform because we are called to live lives that emulate Christ. So I feel it necessary to give this disclaimer. Good works are the fruit and not the root of your salvation. Good works are the fruit and not the root of your salvation. So, we have these two paths behind us, one of rugged individualism, me and mine first, the other of curating a rule of life that allows us to experience existence in the way that God desires for us to experience it. And in order to start curate, curating that rule, you need to ask yourself the question, who am I and where do I thrive? You know, that has caused me to start actually asking some questions about myself. And I discovered two things this week, two things that I'm going to share with you. If you repeat them outside of the context of this church, I'll just deny that I said them. Thing number one, friends, I am way, way, way too invested in structures. Routines give me comfort. And I realized that my desire to have a routine and everything set up is really just a facade and it's actually made me miss the reality that as the poet says God plays in 10,000 places so I need to be more open and I'm going to invite you if you struggle if you are someone like me a type a personality that likes everything organized a particular way make some rule room in your rule of life for spontaneity Amen. because if you don't and if you don't, you're going to miss that God appears to us in unexpected places in unexpected ways. The second thing that I realized this week about myself is that I spend way too much time with my nose in a book. That I prefer to inhabit the mansions of the mind than the realms of fleshy existence, relationships. And the reason for that is relationships make us vulnerable. And I don't like vulnerability. And so these are the two things that I've realized. And then I've asked myself the question, if the author of Ecclesiastes is right in his sermon, then could it be possible that my rule of life needs to be broad enough to include you in it? Because we is always better than me. So if we is better than me, then 
I need to start curating an environment that is going to make relationships possible. In order to develop a new skill, you need to provide an ecosystem for that skill to grow. Now, you might be saying, well, I want more. I want to have in my rule of life better relationships. Or you might be saying, I want to partake of community. Or you might be saying, I want to have a renewed faith. But the reality is that we spend way too much time noticing these things about ourselves and then trying. So I want to invite you today, this morning, to make a commitment after you've gone through some self-introspection. And that is, let's stop trying and let's start training. Now, what is the difference between trying and training? Well, trying involves engaging in this constant conversation, this self-defeating discourse that says, tomorrow I'm going to do things different. Tomorrow will be the day. And as you have these conversations about tomorrow, you continue inhabiting the same patterns and the same habits that you have your whole life. Trying doesn't work. In order to live the life that God has called you to live, you need to start training. And what is training? Training requires creating a habit and a structure. A trellis, if you will, that ensures that the things that you want to improve upon are being practiced. So the author continues in Ecclesiastes 4, and he says to us, If neither of them, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered. Two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. You're called to live in community. The best you possible exist as you interact and in, as your life interacts and intersects with someone else's life. So, we've discovered the problem, loneliness. The author of Ecclesiastes has given you the antidote, togetherness. You've realized that in order to make that journey, you need some time for introspection. And that introspection is not enough. You've got to get good at the art of training. But then the question becomes, okay, pastor, what next? How do I build this community? Well, let me give you three simple things that will immediately improve your interactions with those whom God has called you to live your life with. Three things. Three things that you need to do. Three things that you need to say. Three things that you need to think about. So perhaps this morning you came to church and you got into a fight with your spouse or your significant other and you had to hold hands even though you wanted to strangle them as you walked into church because people are watching or perhaps you asked your child hey you need to change we're get, we're late for church and you came down to the room and you to the living room and you saw them standing eating cheerios dressed in the same pajamas they've been wearing all week <laughs> and you want to strangle them well here's what you do if you really want to create community three things you need to say Are my words kind? Are my words true? But more importantly, are my words necessary? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? And once you start cultivating the capacity to ask this question about your relationships, you'll notice that something happens. You are going to start building a community. So you ask these three things, and then you realize that the art of building community happens one small kindness at a time. In order to build a community, we do so by engaging in one small act of kindness at a time. And that's why God gives us these simple things, water, towels, bread, and wine, things that would be found in any house in the ancient Near East. And he does this because they are simple, but they are an invitation to experience kindness and community. 
You know, one of my favorite writers, the French Antoine de Antoine Exupéry, wrote, and that was a terrible pronunciation of my French. Please don't, please don't, Jane, please don't judge me. She's like, yeah, that was, that was hideous. Please don't judge me. Anyway, he wrote, he wrote a little book. Let's see if this one's better. Called Le Petit Prince. Even worse. The Little Prince. Let's stick to English. The Little Prince. And my favorite quote from that whole book is this. If you want to build a ship, the author says, don't drum up men to go and gather wood. Don't give them tasks and work. But instead, instead, invite them to yearn for the endless, vast ocean. You know, in the medieval times where you're sitting in a church was called a nave. And the reason for that is because a nave in a church was seen as this ship, this journey that we're on. A journey that occurs through community. And so we're going to do communion today, and we're going to sing the songs, and we're going to give the emblems. And as we do, the invitation as you stand and partake of these emblems is that you realize that God called you to live in community. That you are better when you experience life together. That we're yearning for the endless and vast sea. And that as we do that, we are confronted with the realization that in this church, in Anthem, the same thing that applies to the old monasteries hold through. You know, in the old monasteries, they used to write outside of the door and it would say, the one who enters these doors enters a foreigner but once. And once you stepped into those doors, you were part of the family. And that's what communion means. That is the ultimate antidote for loneliness. Let's partake as you come up. Uh, take your, your emblems and then we'll, we'll partake.
before we take this 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 morning I want to encourage you to remember the blessing is that the community of faith that we're part of in Adventism we really do believe also in the act of foot washing and so right after this service I want to encourage you when you go to the baptism please do watch that with Pastor Chris and wonderful girl getting baptized from our high school ministry but then also I want to encourage you to take a moment if you if you're able to go to the fellowship hall and there you can wash one another's feet there's a family room there's guys there's girls there's kind of doing it together as fan friends and so I hope you would take that time to do that as well but now as our community goes into one of the most sacred acts of the family of faith which is remembering the broken body of Jesus on our behalf and the blood that was shed for us for our forgiveness I want you to take a silent moment here together as you might reflect on what this means for you to take a new start with Christ and so I want you to reflect upon Jesus what is it that you're calling me deeper into what is it that you're calling me further away from and what is it Lord that you want from me in this next season this next quarter of my life so I want to ask you to just kind of close your eyes maybe or just ponder look around and take a silent moment of reflection with you and the Lord praying over your life your family your friends maybe some things that the Lord wants to pull you away from or things he wants to deepen in your life so do that right now now friends with me would you take the body of Christ and eat that now in remembrance of him and take the shed blood on your behalf merciful God gracious holy sacred and beautiful God what you did for us in the cross paid for everything and so many times we take it for granted what you've done for us Lord may we be renewed this morning recognizing you gave everything for us you gave it all Lord, may we not take this for granted. May we not make it light and make it insignificant. But Father, we want to tell you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for calling us into community with you, with others, by the gracious gift of what you did for us on the cross. That we might not have to die, but would have eternal life with you. And so, Father, today I pray that your mercy would reign in this place. May your grace be showered on your people. And may they walk through these doors with the sense of peace that a living God, one who was resurrected for us, is with us. In Jesus' precious name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I want you to just squeeze the shoulder of the person next to you and say, Christ is risen and so are we.